This is Public Occurrences, both foreign and domestic. And now your host, Michael O'Fallon. The crisis created by the Biden administration at our southern border is at an absolute priority level with literally millions of people of whom we really don't know who they are that are pouring into our country. And when they pour into our nation, they are given EBT cards, buster flown to their desired destinations, and then they are effectively in the United States as long as they wish. And of course, when video begins to be circulated around the nation of tens of thousands of people who, once again, we have no idea who they are, that are coming through the rivers, pouring into the borders, underneath the overpasses that are around the borders of our country, then the Biden administration has to create a fertile fallacy saying that the Border Patrol agents who have reins in their hands for the horses, you know, the reins, they have to claim that those reins are whips. A totally fabricated accusation Because what the progressive Democrats and globalist Republicans, you know, Republicans that are Republicans in name only, like Marco Rubio, Adam Kinzinger, and Mitch McConnell are doing, is being exposed. And what you will notice is that the exact same situation with millions of migrants coming into the United States from every place in the world is that you will see the same thing happening, not just here in the United States, but in Europe and in the United Kingdom. And in one place that I've seen this occur over the past 12 years, something that's really concerned me a lot, one place that's special to me that has been completely transformed in the last 12 years is Ireland. And Ireland has been completely and utterly changed through mass immigration of unvetted peoples forever. So what's really happening here? Well, it is an attempt at dissolving borders, law, language, and culture, creating, if you will, a massive cultural revolution. And as many of you know about critical race theory, you can properly identify what's going on with mass immigration as this critical immigration praxis. And of course, the word praxis means that this is not just a theory, but something that is being put into practice. It's already being done. It's not just a theory anymore. And it is being put into practice to completely transform our nation and our civilization, to create a preferred class, a class of people who will be living under different laws and much different expectations than you and I. And you can't make the mistake of blaming this on the people themselves. You know, if you lived in Haiti or Honduras or Nicaragua or in the Middle East, where so many of these people are coming from, they've said close to 21 different nationalities came through this past week, both at the southern border in Texas, through Arizona and California. But if you lived in any of these really decrepit nations with a consistent lack of law enforcement and where advanced education and healthcare are not achievable for the average person, where the living wage is so low, well, you might come as well. You might risk everything. But these people are being used as pawns on the chessboard of the state to destroy the old state and build the new supranational state out with the old and in with the new. But this is, make no mistake, critical immigration praxis, the active practicing of the theory itself in real time. And this was impossible as long as Donald Trump was in office. So he had to go, no matter what the will of the people actually was. Now, let me help you understand what this is all about with a quick review on what critical theory, which is the base of critical immigration praxis, which is, of course, derived of what was 
for many years critical immigration theory because now it's being put into practice. But let me get back to the critical theory part of this so you can fully understand what's really going on. Now, as our definitive guide at New Discourses would say, the term critical theory commonly refers to basically the Frankfurt School of Marxist critics. And that includes names such as Lukács, Horkheimer, Adorno, and of course, Marcuse. The critical theory of the Institute for Social Research which is better known as the Frankfurt School, focused on power analysis that began from a Marxist perspective, with an aim to understand why Marxism wasn't proving successful in Western contexts. It rapidly developed a post-Marxist position that criticized Marx's primary focus on economics and expanded his views on power, alienation, and exploitation into all aspects of post-Enlightenment Western culture. Critical theorists sometimes refer to themselves as cultural Marxists, and were referred to that way by others. But the term cultural Marxism is now more commonly used to describe postmodernism, or a certain anti-Semitic conspiracy theory, which is completely false. The big picture agenda of the Frankfurt School was to marry Marxian economic theory to Freudian psychoanalytic theory in order to explain both the rise of fascism and the reasons that the communist revolutions were not taking place in Western democracies, as they had been predicted. Now let's understand that Max Horkheimer defined critical theory in direct opposition to a traditional theory in a 1937 piece called Traditional and Critical Theory. Whereas a traditional theory is meant to be descriptive of some phenomenon, usually social, and aims to understand how it works and why it works that way. A critical theory should proceed from a prescriptive, normative, moral vision for society. Now, that critical vision for society describes how the item being critiqued fails that vision, usually in a systemic sense, and it prescribes activism to subvert, dismantle, disrupt, overthrow, or change it, that is, generally, to break and then remake society in accordance with a particular critical theory's prescribed vision, which is what you're seeing happening right now with critical immigration practice. But you can see how the use of the word critical is drawn from Marx's insistence that everything be ruthlessly criticized, and from his admonition that the point of studying society is to change it and change it, they will. And that is the essence of what critical immigration praxis is. Using mass immigration of people of differing cultures and values to break the melting pot culture that we have traditionally created in the United States with people which many of them are criminals, which many of them have terrible intent. Not all of them. I'm not saying that. But many of them do. But the intention, again, is to break this melting pot culture that we have traditionally in the United States and shatter it to bits, shatter it completely. And the elite globalists will mold it back into their heart's desires. But again, you just think back to the Clinton administration, let's say from 1992 to 2000, and remember that Clinton was actually pretty tough on illegal immigration. A whole lot tougher than Bush for sure. I mean, I had a British tennis professional. This is back in the 90s, back when I was operating tennis academies. I mean, I I had this British tennis professional that was working for me. And I used to run this academy in Largo, Florida. And the immigration police came and arrested him on court in front of all of our students and took him away. And apparently, the papers that he had given me for his proof of work and ability to work were fake. But just think about it. Would that happen in 2021? Would that happen with today's Democrats or progressive Republicans? You know, the Lindsey Grahams, the Nikki Halas of the globalist Rockefeller Republican class. You know, the kind of people that hate Donald Trump. Would that happen with them? What has changed? Where did everyone go suddenly pro-mass immigration? 
and how did we get here? Well, a good place to start is to begin with one of the most brilliant men of the Frankfurt School. And we we have to tip our hat in terms of their brilliance. But they were sick and evil-minded. Well, that man would be Herbert Marcuse. And the essay of Marcuse that I tried to get everyone that I knew to read over the past six years was Repressive Tolerance. And in his essay, Repressive Tolerance, Marcuse echoes Rousseau and argues that public opinion is invalid because a false consciousness has become the general consciousness, enslaving people who do not know they are enslaved. He believes that this tyranny of the majority, which masquerades as tolerance, can only be overcome by militant intolerance. And Marcuse advocates banning the speech and assembly of certain groups, and he calls for the withdrawal of civil rights from a majority who is oppressing the minority. He also supported rigid restrictions on teachings and practices in the educational institutions. In other words, how we traditionally teach. And argues that support for calm and reasoned debate facilitates oppression. What is needed in his mind is the development of an enraged and subversive faction that is willing to engage in violence against the established order. Now, Marcuse believed that the catalyst for this uprising would be alienated minority groups. These new alienated ethnic groups would take the place of the broader working class who, to Marcuse's purposes, seemed content in their supposed oppression. So Marcuse looked to the African-American population as a possible source of agitation and supported militant activism. And it's important to note that Marcuse did not want these activists to succeed in abolishing injustice, but wanted minorities to remain marginalized from the larger society. It's also important to note and to remember that Marcuse's star pupil at San Diego State University was... Angela Davis, spiritual godmother of Black Lives Matter. Maybe some of this is beginning to make sense now. But for Marcusa, the integration into society of supposedly alienated groups acts as a stabilizing force, and thereby it neutralizes the revolutionary elements which, according to Marxism, should be committed to society's overthrow. So you can't allow them to be assimilated into society. You can't allow them to participate in our economic system, in our way of life. So the key for Marcusa was to purposely sow division. And that is what you are seeing right now. And Marcusa did not want to redress wrongs or grievances with the existing social framework, but he wanted to perpetuate and inflame those wrongs and grievances until the social framework could be overthrown. That was his goal. Integrating peoples into a functioning society was not helpful to his goal of revolution. But one major development, which Marcusa may not have even anticipated, was, was helpful. The modern era of mass illegal immigration. So as Marcusa was kind of winding down in age, that era of mass, unvetted, uncontrolled immigration was winding up. The Hart-Seller Act of 1965 exponentially increased the number of immigrants admitted into the United States. And in just a couple of decades there were enough newcomers to begin to overwhelm the assimilation process. And by that time, there were enough critical theorists in academia to challenge the very notion of assimilation. You don't want that. You want to keep them divided. You want to keep them angry. And the open society and world economic forum elites believe that, quote, (laughs) this quote straight from them, Quote, the classic form of the nation state is disintegrating, and they envision a world patriotism. That's why you'll hear everybody start to put down patriotism for the United States or for the UK, because what they will tell you to be is patriotic in regards to a world government. 
But all of this patriotism as being stripped of constitutional language and a culture and devoted to a political authority that extends civil rights beyond borders. Their new claims are that citizenship was never conceptually tied to national identity. That's where you heal everybody using this crazy fake term of, I'm a global citizen. And that their idea that Republican freedom can cut its umbilical links to the womb of the national consciousness, which had originally given birth to it. So Schwab, Soros, and others, they're inspired by Marcusa and now see the possibility of a global public sphere that was once imagined by Kant and Rousseau. And the Rousseauian idea, as well as Hegel's idea and Kant's idea, which is now Schwab's idea, is that the arrival of world citizenship is no longer merely a phantom, that we are still far from achieving it. State citizenship and world citizenship form a continuum that already shows itself, at least in outline form. So for them to reach their goal of supranationalism, a global nation, and for the classic form of nations to disintegrate, national identity must first be dissolved. And their goal is to completely dissolve America's national identity, just like they are dissolving the United Kingdom's national identity, just like how they are dissolving Ireland's national identity. So the monsters that seek to destroy our nation see mass immigration as a catalyst, as a weapon for them to succeed in this process. They constantly praise the effect of multiculturalism on the United States and, in the European context, speak approvingly, saying things like, quote, Immigration from Eastern Europe and poverty-stricken regions of the Third World will intensify multicultural diversity in these societies. This will give rise to needed social tensions that will result in a new way of reforming humanity, end quote. They believe that these social tensions that were sought by Marcusa will hasten the move to a supranational governing structure that is devoid of shared history, of known truth, or tradition. So like Marcusa, Schwab, Soros, and Joe Biden dismiss the suffering that will result from these social tensions. You'll hear things like, it's going to be worse, it's going to get worse until it gets better. And you'll hear them saying that there's going to be some time of pain but eventually we're going to come out on the other side. They dismiss concerns over the upheaval caused by mass immigration, referring to such concerns as chauvinism of prosperity, as if societies that have taken centuries to build should be ripped to pieces for the sake of a Marxist form of equity. That is what Joe Biden is doing, and that is what Schwab wants. That is what Soros is actively making happen. They believe that our own national tradition will have to be appropriated in such a manner that it is related to and relativized by the vantage points of other cultures. They see mass immigration and the relativizing of cultures as a way of democratizing citizenship. Notice the words that are being used and how they're being abused. Now, this entire nation-destroying process of flooding of unvetted people into our nation is being pushed with a particular goal in mind. They believe that only democratic citizenship, again an abuse of terms, can prepare the way for a condition of world citizenship which does not close itself off with particular biases, which accepts a worldwide form of political communication. In other words... Global courts. Global judges. This view is now pervasive amongst most Republicans. When I say Republicans, I mean in the Rockefeller Republican sense. And the progressive Democrats. And also, like Boris Johnson, as they call for unlimited immigration to transform the United Kingdom into a community of communities and a multicultural post-nation that sheds its cultural identity. 
These sentiments are nearly universal in American university and are routinely pushed by post-American politicians and activists. And they're on both sides of the aisle. I mean, if you remember, while campaigning for president, Joe Biden tersely summarized this view with his assertion that people who entered the United States illegally are more American than most Americans are. In other words, to fake President Biden, America is merely a vague, unrooted piece of land that should be shaped by progressives that are going to progress America into a larger, greater body, a supranational body, where your patriotism is going to be demanded to the globalist body. And by this, I don't mean your patriotism to the United States of America. You know, what we were encouraged to do just 12 years or so ago. But instead, you must be a patriot to the global union. And for this to happen, what must be done is that Biden, Schwab, and Soros must end what we know as constitutional law and the United States. And how do you do this? Well, the first thing that determines where America's law begins and where it ends is a border. Yeah, it really is that simple. The borders of the United States determine that our laws and systems of laws and our rights begin and end at the border. On the other side of the border, Mexico's laws begin, or Canada's new Chinese Communist Party laws begin. But if there is no border, then it is unclear where our laws actually begin and end. And if you have an administration whose job it is to administrate law, that's what administration does, who refuses to administrate law or who works with progressive Democrats and globalist Republicans to pass new immigration and sanctuary city laws that effectively ends the United States. Then you have men and women who exist to deconstruct the United States and hence deconstruct our society, deconstruct our way of life, deconstruct our healthcare system, deconstruct our liberties and our freedoms. And behind these decisions from our Fabian and fake elected officials are World Economic Forum and Open Society positions. And it is fueled by skepticism and the intolerance of critical theory with its contempt for the rule of law and efforts to integrate newcomers into a majority culture that is seen now as oppressive. And this contempt extends to patriotic citizens who are now being taught to embrace a hatred for their countries and for their histories and have the 1619 Project shoved down their throats. You know, like the hating of our founders, like the shaming of our founding documents, even within our own national archives. And just like previous revolutions, in the French Revolution, in the Russian Revolution, which became the Soviet Union, in the Chinese Revolution and the Cultural Revolution of China, this great upheaval is being undertaken with the foolish hope of creating a secular utopia. And so our new almost citizens will now be integrated into the United States, not like how my abuela and abuelo were that came from Cuba, and not like my wife and her family who were taught to appreciate and love the United States and our Constitution when they came over legally from Hong Kong. No, you see, our new citizens will be told that what they need to do is to hate the nation and founders of the nation that is now here to create them into a new class of untouchable citizens. And instead of assimilation, they will be taught critical race theory, intersectionality, and will be told that patriots who are in this nation who opposed illegal immigration actually oppose the new illegal arrivals because of their ethnicity. And that, of course, is not the case. We don't hate people because of their ethnicities. The men, women, and children that are being assisted by NGOs financed by, let's say, Open Societies Foundation and other organizations associated with the UN and the World Economic Forum are being used as chess pieces, chess pieces by a progressive globalist elite class that lives with massive borders around their homes, with high walls around their homes. And so you should be asking the question, why do wealthy politicians 
and oligarchs build walls, fences, and gates around their homes. They don't build walls because they hate the people from the outside. It's because they love the people on the inside. But most Americans don't live in gated estates or communities. That's something that we all understand. The only mansion they've ever had any share in is the presidential mansion in Washington, D.C. The only ground we can all claim as our own is the territory of the nation in which we live. Purchased, of course, by the blood, sweat, toil, and tears of our ancestors. And fortified by the goodwill that maintains us armed in heart and conscience to fortify and defend it. Now, of course, snarky elitists in the media and the Congress know that love drives them to protect the estates they have developed for themselves. Yet when we seek to defend the whole we have in common, made fertile by our spirit and mortal sacrifice, they call us haters and pretend we should desist and insist that we are the monsters who insist on protecting our nation and our laws. Now just think about it for a moment. Nancy Pelosi has put up walls, barbed wire, and of course, the troops to guard the U.S. Capitol from us, even though that we aren't going to attack it. But they won't do a thing at our border to protect our nation as a whole. And since this logic makes no sense, we have to wonder what really motivates intelligent people that have to keep browbeating us with it. Well, since it lets them hold on to their fortified homes, their gated estates, and putting gates and walls around their offices, while the home we have in common suffers destruction, doesn't it make sense to assume that its destruction actually is their aim? They seek to destroy this country. They want us to surrender the ground upon which, by the grace of God, we may claim to govern ourselves. This would leave them firmly secure in the possessions governed by their private whims. But when they alone are able to protect their wealth, and as people we are reduced to nothing but the memories of our once great nation, who among us is stupid enough to believe we will live in their world as anything but subjects or slaves? Because that is what they have created over the past year and a half. An obedient citizenry. A slave class. Freedoms? <laughs> you will do as you're told. Where you can go, what magical vaccines must be put in your body, what you can think, what you can talk about, and what you can't talk about. So these fake Republicans and radical Democrats committed to overthrowing our constitutional sovereignty from within will continue efforts already underway to turn the migrant masses into voters, disregarding their lack of citizenship. In tragic fact, the people entering our country illegally come from countries where, when the facade of electoral politics exists, it serves to mask the domination of ideological, military, or economic factions who govern by force and intimidation. Those are the countries they come from. And without regard for the actual will of the people they govern, that's who their leaders were. Tyrannical banana republics who rule by force of will, not the rule of law. So, In the course of my lifetime, Politics in the United States has become more and more infected by this same species of tyranny. And both political parties are tainted by it. Our religious organizations like Roman Catholic Church and the Gospel Coalition are infected with this winsome tyranny. The battle over the entry into our territory is the crisis intended to complete our transformation from a people struggling to restore and maintain our self-government to a people returned to the shadow of oligarchical tyranny that pretty uniformly oppressed humankind everywhere before the exceptional success of America's experiment in Republican self-government. This is critical immigration praxis. The fake globalist Republicans and progressive Democrats are practicing critical theory and imposing critical theory on immigration. It's Marcusa at work. It's Marcusa's world. It's Marcusian politics. 
and the leadership of both major party factions in the U.S. Congress appear to be dominated by forces committed to the global return of oligarchical tyranny. They have quietly cooperated in recent years to promote the destruction of the moral foundations of the United States by neglecting, discouraging, and now abandoning and even criminalizing the Christian ethos that uniquely equipped our nation's spirit for self-government, the discussion of our federal union by suppressing the residual sovereignty of our state's governments, the disintegration of our sense of common identity as a people by undermining our common language encouraging the whimsical proliferation of incompatible religious, sexual, or subjectively individual identities, degrading the existence and importance of the natural family, and inflaming old wounds so that vengeful passion reignites conflict amongst our racial and ethnic groups. And even our faith-based organizations are participating in this with the gospel of vengeance. Until the common sense of right, justice, and human worth has been utterly abandoned, on which the good people of the United States united, time and time again, to win battles against slavery, ruthless economic exploitation, and the violent denial of human worth to people from motives of hatred roused and exploited by coldly calculated, selfish interests bent on securing absolute power. And in the context of this determined effort to regress our people toward oligarchical oppression, the battle to regain control of our southern border comes into focus as the critical threat to our continued existence as a free, sovereign, constitutionally self-governed people. We must win. I'm Michael O'Fallon, and this has been Public Occurrences both foreign and domestic.